So as Patrick was saying, my name is Paolo Del Mundo, and this talk is going to be absolutely different than what you're used to. Other speakers are trying to get you to use their technology, their framework, their language. I'm trying to tell you not to use microservices. <laughs> Why would I do that? My experience is born out of the work I did at Opower. Uh, about four years ago, I started as a newly minted Opower engineer. And one of the first projects that I worked on was a microservices migration. And we got swept up with all the buzz that you can see in all the sites nowadays. Uh, some of our software architects were from Amazon, from Netflix. And they thought, if it works there, it would work for Opower. And you know, as a new software engineer, I thought, this is great. You know, it's not usually the case that you're on a cutting edge project. So I was happy. But after a few months, I realized that we were ill-equipped to handle this new world that we were in. Um, I first noticed that when I was on this three-month project, and we slipped, you know that feeling? And then we slipped again. So we doubled the actual delivery to six months. When we did deliver to production, we would see all these errors that we, quite frankly, wouldn't have dealt with if we were in a monolith. So that's my introduction. Uh, so here's my agenda. I'm first going to talk about what microservices is, because as I said, it's so overloaded. It's such an overloaded term nowadays that we should first sync up and know what exactly it is. And I'm going to talk about why uh, you would want to do it. And I do believe there are advantages. Don't get me wrong. But you've got to be the right, the right person, the right team that adopts it. And my favorite part, if you haven't noticed, is the problems I encountered when dealing with it. And you will too. All right, so let's sync up first and talk about what a monolith is. So imagine that we're building an Amazon Lite app. So what are the features for Amazon? There's user accounts, shopping cart, product catalog, and so on and so forth. Eventually, we'll have a wedding registry. Now, a monolith, you bundle all of these features onto the same app server. Now, a microservice, you would, bundle, uh, you would, you would cut these features apart and place them onto different app servers. Why would we want to do this? This is more complicated. Well, Christmas time comes around, and you know, your Amazon app is getting so much user activity. And the only way that you, well, one of the ways you can scale in a microservice architecture is by uh, it, putting all these user accounts into different app servers. And you can handle the load just by simply adding another one. Our wedding registry, nobody gets married in December. I think, but, <laughs> but so, and so we'll keep, we'll keep it to, except my brother, by the way. Uh, so we'll just put it on one app server or, or just a few. We don't have to have the same scale. So scalability is definitely a big thing with microservices. The other big thing is being able to choose your own languages and technologies and frameworks. Our team was a Node.js uh, team. We, we really love Java, JavaScript. <laughs> um, and we didn't want no stinking Java, right? Even though Opower was mainly based of, on Java. So we, because we were using microservices, we can, we can choose the technologies that we want, uh, as long as we maintain the same contract as these guys are using. All right, so here, so I've talked about the problems. I've talked about the advantages. Now I'm going to talk about the problems. Number one, troubleshooting. I'll give you an example. I'm the on-call engineer. Saturday night, I get a call. Some of our users are getting 500 errors. Uh, all right, so I log on as one of the users, and I don't see it. I'm seeing, I'm seeing just a great page. I'm going to ask the audience, what would you do in my situation? Look at the logs. Look at the logs. OK, there's, 
a million, a bajillions of lines of logs. All right. Hacker news, exactly. All right, so I, I logged on as a user. I didn't see it. I did it multiple times. Five, one out of five times, I would see the error. All right, so load balancing. So I individually query every, so service A is mine. I individually query every server that we own, and it's the same thing, one out of five. So it's not, it's not, it's not here. So I, I say, okay, maybe it's this guy's problem. It's the guy that I'm depending on, all right? So I query, this, I do the same thing. I say, all right, is it here? No. Is it here? No. Is it here? Yes. They ran out of memory. Why? I don't, it doesn't matter. But the point is, <laughs> it's freaking hard to tell what is going on, right? And you, you're right. You know what? You got, you... Uh, when you, you <laughs> essentially, I was going to say, logs are a great way to find out the problem. But back then, we didn't have a good logging system. And that's why I say we were ill-equipped to handle this new world. There are prerequisites that you need to have before you even attempt this thing. Uh, th so logs are important. Uh, we'll get that to la later. This is Nagios. Uh, this would have prevented the issue that I had on Saturday evening. It tells you from a bird's eye view what's going on in your network. Here's another view, another tool. This is Datadog. Um, I like it because it's so simple. You can see exactly where things are happening. You can drill down to it. And again, logs, problem with logs, there's so many. Uh, you need a tool like, I, I really like this tool called Splunk. Essentially, you ingest all your logs into this into the Splunk server, and you can make SQLite SQLite queries against it, and it even graphs it even graphs the uh, errors for you. For example, so I can tell like, oh, there's this big spike. Maybe during the time I was deploying something, let me let me investigate that. So troubleshooting is difficult, and I can't stress this enough. It was painful. Performance is all, was also painful. So there's this mistaken belief that scalability is equal to performance, but that's not the case, right? Scalability is being able to handle uh, a huge load or you know, being able to scale with that load. Performance, it doesn't mean that it's fast. Um, here's, a, here's a source that everyone might have seen. It's called latency numbers every programmer should know. If you were deploying a monolith and everything was in the same app server, this is what it would take to, query, to call that thing you're depending on. But because you, you know, in, in our case, we were using REST over HTTP, this is the cost that it would take to get to service B. And then that also trickles down when you're calling other services. So it's very important that every service publishes their numbers. Um, an example here, imagine if I have three services and they all publish their numbers. I know that the time it would take for me to service a request myself would at least be this much. So it's really important to use load testing tools. Any one of these will do, but it's super important to use them and publish them so other people will know. All right. Final thing that I found really difficult was testing. So here's a simplified version of our environment. We're service A, and we depend on service B, and service B has three dependencies. How do I even test this? We can go the traditional way and you know, put them into an integration server. We had a, a staging environment where we would put all the services. But that's painful, right? Because what if, well, first of all, I can't test the same time someone else is testing. Um, what if I put it on, on my machine? Can I bring this up? Can I bring this world into being on, on my local machine? Yeah, but it's hard, right? Think about it. You have to know how to build Service B. You have to know 
how to run it. You have to know how to curate the data for it. And that's just one service. You still have these left. And in a real environment like ours at Opower, we had 50 services. Um, on, my, on my particular project, um, our tree went like maybe 10 deep. So it was really complicated. Uh, here's a tool that could help. Uh, I think you guys are familiar. It's called Docker Compose. Essentially, what it does is you can specify your infrastructure in a YAML-like file. And with one command, you can bring it up to being. Now, that helps a lot, but it's not a panacea either. Because you know, things fail for no apparent reason. That it's not, it might not be any of these services' fault, but things will fail and make your end-to-end -end tests brittle. Uh, there's this tool that I've been experimenting with. It's called Pact. It goes with this, uh, this idea called contract-driven testing. And essentially, what it is, is uh, it is a mock service and a mock client. So here, if, uh, let's say, I have an endpoint called products v1, Pact will create a mock service for it. And I can define what I expect will come back when I make this response, uh, when I make this request. And on the other end, it will also make a mock client for any of the providers. So here, I'm going to say it's, it's going to, on the opposite, I can say that if, that if the mock client gives this, service B should return that. Both of these things are put into a PAC server, and it can compare them and make sure that, you know, that they're matching up. So if service B breaks its contract or breaks its implementation, then the PAC server should be able to catch that. So I haven't quite experimented with this, but a lot of people have said that this was you know, a better way than end-to-end -end testing. So I, I'm going to leave you with this quote. It's from this random guy that I pulled up from the internet. Uh, Martin Fowler, I don't know if you, any of you guys have heard of him, but he agrees with me. So uh, actually, he doesn't. So he, he, he says the same thing as I do. Microservices has an, there is an advantage. But you have to really know what you're getting into. Uh, in fact, he recommends that you build a monolith first, vet the, uh, you know, the app, and see if you are getting that, if it warrants going to a microservice architecture. Then you implement the microservice, but not before then. Because you, know, you, you don't know until it happens. So it's, it's, like, it's sort of like a, you know, a lean startup kind of thing. We're trying to vet whether we will get the load by building the app first. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>